Not that long ago, I produced a video highlighting the design process of my first 3D printed mini subwoofer, and even as a rough proof of concept draft, many of you found what it did quite impressive, so today we'll expand on that as I introduce version 2 along with some more design philosophy. So here's the generic process that I tend to follow. First, I design a prototype. The prototype is tested, the findings are then used to guide any necessary changes, and once implemented the revised prototype is tested some more. I call this the spin cycle, and the prototype doesn't emerge from it until I'm happy with the test results, at which point the design can proceed to its final destination, whether that's production or a one-off build for personal use. The unique thing about this project is that it's not meant to be a consumer product, rather a proof-of-concept showpiece validating FDM printing as a viable fabrication method for loudspeaker enclosures. And we certainly made some strides in that direction, but with plenty of room for improvement. So let's talk about version 2 now that it's had a go around the spin cycle. Right away, the original design did look pretty cool just sitting there in two pieces, but once it came together, not only was the intricacy of the waveguides concealed, but the curvature along the split didn't translate to a physical print well enough to preclude air leaks, and leak it did. So the solution that I chose to explore this time around is the classic tongue and groove joint. The split was made along a flat plane with a channel along the lower section and a corresponding protrusion along the upper section. If everything goes to plan, the two parts should simply interlock to form the finished product. And as you can see, I also redesigned the exterior to reflect some of the internal geometry, namely the layout of the waveguide, which I think we can all agree is the defining feature of this model. Internally, not much has changed, but I did revise the cross-section of the waveguide a little to improve the laminar flow, and adjusted the volume of the coupling chamber accordingly. Moving on to the actual print, for anyone interested, each half took about 45 hours to complete, which sounds like a lot of time until you consider the fact that this is a set it and forget it process requiring no supervision. You just go do something else in the meantime. But there is a sense of excitement anytime you go to check on your print, kind of like when you go to look up a tracking number for some cool thing you've ordered. And one of the reasons it took as long as it did had to do with the number of perimeters and the infill density that I specified in the G code. Just for comparison, the original print was 2 perimeters thick with a 15% gyroid infill, while this one is 4 perimeters thick with a 20% rectilinear infill, taking nearly 20 extra hours to finish. This is where some of the more seasoned makers among my audience may point out that it's overkill, and structurally it probably is, but acoustically this is my way of adding mass, thereby helping the enclosure absorb rather than conduct vibration. And I have to say that I'm quite impressed with just how solid this print feels. I know it's impossible to convey through video, but for what it's worth, listen to this. It sounds kind of like Baltic birch, solid, rigid, and with some decent weight to it, all of which seems promising, so let's wire in some terminals and get this thing put together. I've gotten some really good advice in the comments for the various adhesives I could use, but I'm not ready to give up on JB Weld just yet. Not until I've given it a chance to work under circumstances as foolproof as this. I also left half a millimeter of clearance between the tongue and the groove to make room for the adhesive, and I loaded the driver in there to help align the two halves along the mounting hole. 24 hours later, we're all set to wire it up for sound. By the way, not a bad idea to put some sealant between the driver and the box. Bluetack seems to do the trick. As a preface, I'd like to emphasize that this is not a full-range driver. Tangband markets it as a mini subwoofer, which in a full-range design would be crossed over with a tweeter. And since we're taking everything a step further, here's the revised test rig. Zoom UAC2 once again as our source with the output bypassing the main DSP, getting mixed down to mono and being fed directly to a single channel of this Dayton Audio DTA100 amplifier. Physically, it's a lot smaller than the Emotiva we used last time, and Class T or similarly efficient circuitry is also more likely to be found in a portable application of this sort. Power-wise, the driver will be operating somewhere in the neighborhood of 35 watts. Looking even further ahead, it stands to reason that a product engineered to this extent isn't going to rest on a passive crossover network. So after we've had our first listen, I will do some response analysis and apply digital correction using this mini DSP module, which, again, not impossible to cram into a portable speaker. 
And I realize that we're not all going to agree on the choice of music for this, but I'm using the same track as last time just to maintain that reference, once again capturing the sound with the mini DSP ears binaural microphone right here at the desk, as well as the far side of the room. And just to make the experience more immersive, I'll blue tack a camera onto the ears that way you're hearing and seeing things from the same perspective. Finally, if you'd like to offer some listening commentary, in the interest of context, do include a brief description of whatever speaker or headphone setup you're using. Here we go. So, hopefully this gives you some idea as to how the new enclosure performs. My own experience, as I sit here next to it, is that it sounds very much at odds with its size. I kept checking other speakers on the off chance that I accidentally left them on, but nope, it's just the little 3 inch going to work. The sound is noticeably cleaner than it was with the original, less hollow and you can actually feel the bass in your chest pretty much anywhere in the room. But now let's introduce a DSP just before the amp, create a high pass filter around 35Hz, work out some of the peaks, and raise the upper shelf to compensate for the fact that this is a subwoofer. What we end up with is a bandwidth of around 40Hz to 3kHz, which still doesn't eliminate the need for a tweeter, but at this point it's just sheer entertainment, pushing the limits and so forth. I'll play a few more bars of the same track and follow that up with some other royalty-free music just to bounce around the spectrum a bit. Here we go.
So, in closing, I'd like to address all the requests for me to make the STL files available for purchase. And to those concerned, I'm happy to announce that I've just created a Thingiverse account with this enclosure as my first upload. Free of charge, though you're more than welcome to tip the designer as the button suggests. And I'll post links to everything down below so that you don't have to rely on my testimony and instead experience this for yourself. Let me emphasize once more that, by design, this is a subwoofer. Not intended to play much above 200Hz, or below 40Hz for that matter, it's a toy. Print one for work, stick one in the car, hey, see if you can power it with a head unit. However you set it up, tag me and I'll come check it out. That being said, thank you for watching, don't forget to rate the video accordingly, subscribe if you haven't already and I'll see you in the next one. We'll start on a brand new build, a bigger one. We'll also talk about what's in this box. Cheers!